Well, praise the name of Jesus. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, and we had a great time of praise and worship and good Sunday school this morning, and now we just want to get into his word in the order of preaching that we've been called to do. And so today we're going to go to the book of Revelation. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want to want to welcome those that uh, might be streaming and hope the Lord blesses you today with our message. But we're going to Revelation today, <clears throat> excuse me, the book of Revelation, chapter 4, or I'm sorry, chapter 3, chapter 3, we're going to go to the very end of chapter 3 to the message to uh, the church of Laodicea, the very last church that, uh, that, the, that it was written to. <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of congestion. All right, so we're going to begin reading in verse 14 of chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. If my people would just stand as we read the Holy Scriptures to open up this morning. Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. It says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And let me make a comment here. Most all of you would probably recognize, hopefully your Bible shows it in red, Jesus is doing the speaking here. He says he's the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth, and it could say, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for our time of praise and worship and Sunday school, but now we come, Lord, to share your word. Oh, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, come. Bring your word alive to us. Speak through me. Allow me to say those things, Lord, that are truth. Help me to speak, Lord, clearly. Help me to speak truth, pleasing to you. And, Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, we're in that great mysterious book called the Book of Revelation. It's almost like we have two books it almost seems like you've got the first chapter of 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 uh, John telling us how he got this revelation that Jesus was given by God it says and given to him to give to the church the body of Christ and that's the first chapter and then in the second and third chapter and we're at the end of the third chapter we have that seven churches that he told John to write to and this is the last one and then chapter 
four just seems like it's just a whole other mysterious world, the beginning of the end of how everything's going to turn out, and that's that part we're all interested in, we all talk about, and we have uh, so many different views of different things, and it's mysterious to us all. But I think maybe we sometimes overlook the first three chapters, and there's so much information there for us. The question arises, I, I guess you'd say, and at the very, the very end of the chapter, I read that very last verse, it says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And I, say, I guess the first question that would come possibly if you're really doing a, a study on the book of Revelation and trying to separate where does this come in, so to speak, as far as the, we're talking end time stuff. And, and these are the churches that were actively meeting and fellowshipping and living for God. These, these are the churches when when John was given the revelation so so this is the things that are you might say is one of the one of the things that that are these seven churches were active and and God told the Lord Jesus told John I want you to write in a book and send to these seven churches and so we I, I can ask myself at the very end here and my focus is going to be the verse before it about overcoming God wants us to overcome and that's what my message is really about today but it says, he that hath an ear in that last verse, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So I guess the first thing I would say as far as breaking this down is to tell you that it appears that at the very least that the book, the, 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 the first three, cha or the, the second and third chapter in particular, the letter was written to all seven churches. So they all got to read what he said to the seven churches. That would be my my first thought on that, he didn't just send part of it to the first part to to the church of Ephesus, which was the first church, and then to the church of Smyrna, the second one. He didn't just send them their part, because look at the way that's worded in the last one. Uh, Let him that hath the ears hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And I also, I, I'm, I also believe that God looking ahead... I uh, wanted us to look at this, this as well. Yes, he was speaking to a specific church. Yes, he was rebuking them. Yes, he was chastening them. Yes, he was telling them he'd spew them out of their mouth if they didn't s repent and turn and get things right and, and so on. He was speaking to the, the people at Laodicea. But if we take the whole counsel of God, how can we not recognize that whatever he was telling those people to look at in all the seven churches, how he rebuked, how he chastened, how he admonished them, how he told them to keep the faith, basically, those that keep the things written in this book. And whether he was talking about, in some of those verses, the entire book of Revelation could very possibly be true, too. But the one thing we can know is that we can learn in the relationship of God with us by looking at how he dealt with those churches, how did he deal with them? Was it all grace, 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 grace? No affliction, everything's perfect, everybody's healthy and whole, nobody's ever going to have any problems. Uh, in fact, even, you know, is everybody predestined, uh, you know, and, and yet he says some other things later that tell us that possibly there's some things we need to understand about all that. But, but there's a lot we can learn just as the Apostle Paul told us, he, he said, look back in the Old Testament and learn. And, and these churches were before, uh, well, they weren't before Jesus. I'm sorry, I was kind of referring a little wrong there. But, but, but we can look at these churches and we can learn. We can learn about how God deals with his people. I mean, this is his churches, seven churches. And, uh, and so we want to look at that today. I'm just going to go through the text, but my, my key verse, let me just read that real quick. I titled this to him that overcomes because in verse 21, he says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. To him that overcometh. Even as I overcame and sat with my father in his throne. And that's, that's the the focus of where I want to go today, I want you to understand God wants you and he wants me. He's given us the power to do it. He wants us to overcome. 
whatever the affliction is, whatever the disease is, whatever the addiction is, whatever uh, bondage you have, whatever emotional problem you have, whatever it is in your life, whatever financial problem, whatever it is in your, your family circumstances, your job, whatever it might be, whatever problems it gives you, whatever affliction it gives you, whatever test or trial or testing that it gives you, God says he wants you to overcome, even as he overcome. And I think if you just, uh, before I come back to that, because that's going to be the key to the, the main thing toward the end of the message, is that God desires for us to be more than conquerors. And he gives us a great promise, which we'll talk about as we go through the text. But let us go back to the first of it real quick. Let us recognize there's seven churches. Most people believe, or I say most, many theologians believe that the seven churches represent seven types of churches. There are churches today, I guarantee you, that are lukewarm. You know that and I know that. There's people, and you have to judge your own heart, but there's people that are also neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. And so, uh, so that could apply to us. We, we know there's a variety of churches. We know that in the very, and most theologians believe that the very first church was Ephesus, and he, he said that they had a great love. They began with a great love for God, and they'd start falling away, and he told them to repent and turn back to their first love. And so many theologians believe that the first church was, was, was like, for example, your first love for Jesus and then by the time you get to through history, when, he, when we're looking at the chronological order of these, uh, the view of this, is that by the time you get to now, the end time church be, is the Laodicean church. They see it as a chronological. And that's, that's believed by many, many uh, theologians and scholars, that we have the types of churches and we have the beginning church to the end of the church in the history of time. And today, that would, if we believe we're at the end time, which... I believe most of us do, then we're the Laodicean church. Yuck. That means we better check our hearts. Are we a, in our individual church, are we a Laodicean church that is neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm? Because Jesus says, I would vomit you or spit you or spew you, the King James says, out of my mouth. So these are the things we can look at as far as application in our lives. And he starts off talking to the Laodicean church, <clears throat> and, and he just mentions who he is and, the, and different aspects of his character. And then verse 15, he says, I know thy works. I think the first thing we can see, if you go to all seven churches, first thing he says, this is who I am with different description of who he is. All seven churches, he does that with every one of them. And every one of them, then he says this exact same wording. I know thy works. I guess I'd have to look at you today as we're going through this today, as we apply this thing to our individual lives, me as well. God knows my works, whether they be good, whether they be bad, whether they be a lie, whether my life is really true as a Christian. Whether I'm walking the talk or not walking the talk, where I've been, what I see, what I do, what I say, the people I hang around, do I fellowship, do I go to church, do I hang around Christians, do I fellowship with the body? Those are very, very important issues these days because many people have fallen out of fellowship because of the COVID issue that we have. But he says, I know thy works. I want you to know he knows every hair on your head. He knows every hair on my head, and it's not as many as it was when I was younger, but he knows every hair, and, and he knows everything that's going on in your life, and he knows everything going on in my life. Therefore, we're going to come to that verse, be zealous and repent. A, a lot of it, I think, for each one of us, especially if we're lukewarm or, you know, we're, we're lukewarm, not hot or cold. All right, so in, in that 15th verse, he says, I, w I wish that you were. In other words, if you're cold, you know, then, then it's an easy issue, isn't it? And if you're hot on fire for Jesus, it's an easy issue, isn't it? But if you're in the middle, then you, you could be kind of playing games. And God says, I don't like that. Make a choice. Serve me or don't serve me. Walk with me or don't walk with me. 
Read your Bible or don't read your Bible. I wish you were either one or the other because you're right in the middle, and I don't like that, Jesus says. And so in application, we have to look at our lives. Are we sitting on the fence? Are we double-minded? Double-minded receiveth nothing from the Lord, it says. Do you walk in faith or do you walk in unbelief? These are all things, questions for us. And in verse 16, I've already quoted it, that if you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, he's going to spew you out of your mouth, vomit you. That's, a, I, and that's why I said at the first, yuck. If we're the end-time church, as most theologians think in the sequence of seven churches, that this is a representative of, of the church at the end of time when Jesus is going to come back is what we're talking about, then yuck. I don't want to be part of a Laodicean church, and neither do you. I don't want to be a Laodicean in, in the way they're described here. All right, verse 17. Because thou sayest I am rich, increased in goods, have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know, what he's saying is that what you think and what I think are two different things. You think you're okay. I'm o you remember the book back in, I think it was back in the 70s or early 80s, but I'm okay, you're okay. You know, everybody's okay, I guess. And Jesus is saying that's not so. You think you're okay. There are so many believers, in fact, in America, because we're raised in a Christian nation, uh, the majority of people that are lost, at least from my generation, that, uh, th that aren't Christians, let's say, they think they're probably okay. Well, I, I do enough good works. I you know, I'm a good moral person, you know, and, and they think they're okay, and that's the biggest problem. You know, the hardest person to get saved a lot of times is the person that thinks they're already okay because they don't recognize that we're all sinners and need salvation. And so, uh, so here he's getting on them. They think they're okay, and he says, no, you're not. Why? We've already talked about it. You're neither cold nor hot. You're lukewarm right in the middle. You think you're okay, and you're not. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thou shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And so basically, he's saying, look, you're not okay. You're lukewarm. I've already said that, and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth if you don't repent. But he's going to say that really. Let me read that next verse. As many as I have rebuke, I love, I rebuke and chasten, be thou zealous therefore and repent. And so he's telling them they're not okay, and one day at judgment time they're going to be ashamed. They're going to be, they're going to be naked in the sight of God, and naked, they're going to feel naked in the presence of God because they're not okay. They're not clothed with righteousness, and that's the key to have the robe of righteousness on, walk in that, and, uh, and live a, a righteous life before God. If not... You can stand before God and be very ashamed and feel naked before him because you were the way you were and not what you should have been, I guess, is the way you'd word it. And that, that verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, repentance is sometimes that just turns a lot of people off, but repent basically means change, turn. Do it because of God. Not just for yourself, but for yourself. Do it for God. Turn from your old way, go to the new. Turn to, to uh, instead of being cold, turn to being hot. Be zealous for God. Turn to God. Read his Bible. Go to church, fellowship. Get close to God. Spend time in prayer. Seek God. Be zealous, therefore. Buy from me gold. In other words, God's uh, economy of gold and silver is different than man's economy of gold and silver. Precious gold and silver is spiritual gold and silver. And so he's telling them to, to seek him. Seek him. Get the, the real precious gold and silver that, that so many seek on this earth. And, and the real precious silver and gold is spiritual uh, stuff. Sp a relationship with Christ and the, the life of God, the promises of God, and all the stuff and, and that God has for us as his people. Be zealous for God. Turn from the old. Press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, which is what uh, the Apostle Paul said in, in Philippians 3.14. Okay, so verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. 
If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. And he with me. Uh, that's, a, that's a popular verse. I don't know if it's as popular as it used to be, but when I was a young Christian, that was a very, very well-known verse for evangelism. You'd talk to somebody about Jesus, and, and, and you'd see that they, there was some interest there. And, but even if uh, you weren't even sure, you could come up with this verse right here and say, look, God's knocking on the heart, your heart, the door of your heart. And, and I, I many times took them to that verse. It's, it's not meant here as, as a go out and do evangelism verse. And yet, by the same token, what a marvelous verse. It's got truth to it, even though that's out of context, that you go to somebody and say, God's knocking at your door. But it's true, isn't it? Isn't it true? What, it is a beautiful verse, and I've seen many, many people, as I witnessed to them in the earlier years, I saw many, many people respond to that church when you told them that God was knocking at their door. And so even though you might take that out of context, in this case, there's times when God allows that, I believe, and it's used for the right purpose, and, uh, and, and it's a good verse. But you know, he's talking to the church. It's kind of scary. I mean, if you really get down to the spiritual grasping of the depth of this, just this rebuke and chastening that he's given to the latest in church, if you really get down to the foundation of it, there's actually some very, very strong, uh, I t I'm going to use the word terrifying because it's the only thing that comes up to my mind here, but, th but the thought of being spewed or vomited out of God's mouth, being naked before him when we come to him. There's a, a great deal of stuff here. He, he says he's, in this verse, he is saying, I'm knocking on your door. And who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. He might be knocking on your door. We can shut the door. In fact, I, most of you have probably, or many of you have probably, the, there used to be a, a, a photograph or a painting, I think it was a painting, of this uh, verse being uh, shown, you might say, and Jesus was at a door and there's no doorknob because God will not force that door open. He'll strongly, he'll strongly put you in a position where you want to open the door, but you still have the free choice. You can open the door to God or not open the door to God. And, uh, and so we have here him talking to the church. And again, we're looking for application for us with the seven, with the seven churches. We'd have to say, we're the church. Is he knocking at your door? Is there something in your life that he's saying, you're, you're off here? And I'm knocking at your heart and I'm telling you to be zealous and repent because I don't want to have to spew you out of my mouth. I don't want you to be naked before me when you show. I want you to walk the, the walk and walk the talk and be on fire for me, Jesus would say to you. But, but let us move on. 21, here's the verse, the key verse that I had for today. And I've got a couple of scriptures that I'm going to have you turn to. The first one's going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if you want to turn there. But here, let me read the verse, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. And so I would say, I guess, first of all, the question would be, well, what does he mean? I'm going to sit in his throne. Is it now? Is it later? If I, how, well, what's it mean? What, how, what, what in the world? Sit with his throne in his throne. You know, it is strange. I mean, how can we all, there's millions of us, how can we sit in his throne, so to speak? Uh, it's, it's an interesting verse. So, so what does he really mean? Well, first of all, I'd say it's interesting. First of all, let me say this. That this is quite a promise to a, a church that's lukewarm, and he says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth if you don't repent. This is a pretty big promise to say he's going to let us sit in his throne even as he sits in our Heavenly Father's throne. That's pretty neat. In other words, there's always an opportunity. His arms are always open, I believe he's saying here. Repent, and I'm going to let you sit in my throne, and all the promises are, are real for you. And, uh, and so, but, but repentance is necessary. It's needful, and we don't like to talk about repent. You know, we're Christians. We're saved. And, but, but God has to continually work on us, and day by day, when we're off, we need to turn to God, confess our sin to him, and we need to repent and turn and walk the new 
walk that we're supposed to walk. All right, let us look at the verse. I, I really think that, pro that this is probably the best verse that points us to the time when if we're Christians, that we're going to be sitting in a throne with him uh, to some degree. And I believe that's during the time of the millennium when he comes back to earth. First, cha uh, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3 says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest things? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Sort of a mysterious verse. It's interesting how God puts so many truths in in the situation, the circumstances that the church, for instance, in Corinth was going through, they, they, had, uh, they had problems taking care of some of the little matters of church. They needed to judge the matters between one another and straighten out some things the way they should, just in, in God's eyes, just little things as far as what's important. And in the midst of that, he gives us this amazing truth. He says, Do you not know the saints shall judge the world? And that could be what he's talking about here that we're going to sit in his throne, and, and what do you do in a throne? You, you rule as a king, and, and you judge and make decisions and so on. So I just throw that out there for you. I think if there's a verse that kind of maybe points to this, I think this would be a good one. But I also think that as, as we walk with God, we're, we're in him, and we're involved in some of the things that's going on, and he gives us the ability to discern and to judge things in our lives by having the Spirit of God in us. So I, I know that's in there. We're kind of sitting in His throne on, in heavenly places with Christ, and we can't, we can't uh, imagine this spiritual position we're in, but we, we know it's true because the Scriptures say it's true. All right, so I, I read this verse, and he says, he says, I'm going to uh, grant you to sit in my throne even as I overcame and sit in my Father's throne. You know, I, he's trying to encourage us, first of all, to overcome as he overcame. We, we run into so many things that could cause us to turn back. We have so many afflictions, so many diseases, so many sicknesses, so many losses of loved ones, and so many terrible things. I've, I've heard some stories of some people, especially when I was going to the to the jail week after week, I'd hear some of their stories, and I'd, I'd think, oh, my, I can't relate to that for sure. You know, there's some people that's been through some terrible things. But God says we can overcome, and he says, if you will, purpose in your heart to overcome, that he will grant to you to sit in the throne as he overcame. And, he, you know, he encourages in many places, and if we'd recognize that, even with the promises, He's given us promises all through the scriptures if we'd recognize that and recognize, too, his encouragement to make it. He encourages us in verse after verse. I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 3, and then we'll keep that open if you go there because then we'll go to chapter 4 for a couple verses right after we do that one. But Hebrews chapter 3, if you got your Bibles with you, I want to read to you where he's telling us to overcome. Keep the faith, basically. Hebrews 3, verse 1 and 2. He says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Did you realize that when you got saved, that's a, you're becoming a partaker of a heavenly? Not an earthly, a heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. All right, so here he's telling us to look at Jesus, how faithful he was. And you may not recognize this, but even in the book of, I guess in, for sure in the book of Revelation, twice at least, uh, Jesus is called the faithful witness. Jesus was the one that came, and he was a faithful witness to who? to the one true God, that there is a one true God. He was a faithful witness to his God. He accomplished what he was supposed to, and, and, uh, and he was faithful to that. And it says here, I want you to consider him, the one that was, 
faithful. And we can get into why this statement was in Hebrews, but he was just talking about how Jesus was greater than the angels, greater than Moses, who was also faithful, it says. And so it's encouraging us. He says, I want you to be faithful. Wherefore, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, or it could be confession, could be there. Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him. You've been appointed. You've been called. You've been appointed. You've been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have a heavenly calling, and you've been appointed. And one thing you've been appointed to is to overcome. He's appointed you to be more than conquerors. He's appointed you to, to, to overcome the obstacles in your life just one by one. And sometimes they'll come back and you've got to fight them again. But you know that you know that you know because the word of God says it, that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can overcome. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. He says, seeing then, that's in the next chapter, seeing then, Verse 14, 15, that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. There it is again. He, again, he's telling you, hold fast. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are. And because of time, I'm not going to dwell on that. But again, he's encouraging us to look at Jesus. Consider Jesus. Look what Jesus went through. You know, Jesus was tempted. He was a man. And, and I think as human beings, we, and, and knowing that he's the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our Redeemer, our Rock, our Savior, the, the, the third part of the Trinity, God himself that was walking the earth, because we know that we, we don't see sometimes what he went through as a human being. He had to go through more than all of us. You talk about lonely. I mean, even his 12 apostles, they, they fled in the garden. But we see where he overcame, and, and the main one would be, I guess, in, in the wilderness when Satan himself tempted him. He offered him everything, food when he was hungry. He offered him the world. He says that the power has been put in his hand to give you the world. Jesus turned it all down. He wouldn't worship Satan. And that's what we're supposed to do is keep a look at Jesus. He was tempted far greater than you and I. And, of course, the greatest temptation was the cross. What a test. Even he, it says, struggled. He said, oh God, if you can take this cup from me, take it from me. He was human. He, he, he suffered. He was tested and he did not fail God. He was the faithful witness and he's telling us to do the same thing. He even sweated unto blood and it tells you that you've never gone through anything where you had to sweat blood to overcome whatever your test is. So, so he's telling us to be like Jesus. In fact, that word consider that word consider comes from the root word of, I looked this up, it comes from the root word of, um, of uh, star, S-T-A-R. And it's, it's thought that it means look like an astronomer would at the stars. Analyzing stars. Consider, as astronomers would look at the stars, consider Jesus. Look at what he went through. He was tested worse than you. And he was a faithful uh, he, he was faithful to his calling. All right, I want to read to you a couple other verses real quick here before we close. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. He's telling us here who overcomes. Who is it that overcomes? Well, let's read. John tells us in the, in the letter of John. For whosoever is born of God overcomes. You really could stop right there. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If you will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and walk the talk till the day you die, you've overcome. If you won't lose your faith, you've overcome. If you'll keep fighting the fight, you're going to overcome. Oh, you may lose some battles but you're going to win the victory in the end and that's the the glorious thing he's promised us that if you'll keep the faith that if you walk in the faith that if you'll walk the talk so to speak and keep on a robe of righteousness you're going to receive a crown one day you're going to sit with him in his your father's throne whatever that does mean 
And so who is he that overcometh? He that believeth upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We are overcomers. We are conquerors and more than conquerors. And you may not think you're that. The devil doesn't want you to know you're that. Read his word. Study his word. Memorize his word. Use his word. Let it come out of your heart through your mouth. You tell the devil he's a liar. You will overcome. And in uh, Matthew, I just want to close with this. Whatever you're going through, this is a verse or two or three verses in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. You don't have to turn there. You're going to recognize it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Consider. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And Titus tells us, fight the, the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. That's what Paul tells us in the book of Titus. Oh, I'm sorry, in 1 Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto you've been called and has professed or confessed a good confession before many witnesses. He's, Paul's telling Timothy, lay hold. Get a hold of it. Don't let go. Hold on. Overcome. Fight. Recognize you're more than a conqueror. You're a child of God, washed in the blood of Jesus. You are an overcomer. In fact, more than an overcomer, if you can ever get that in your mind and get your mind transformed, you are more than an overcomer. You will overcome if you put Jesus into it and let him help you get through it. He says, come unto me, all yet labor and labor, or heavy laden. Well, I kind of had, I feel like I kind of had to rush a little bit through the last part because of time. But God loves you. He's called you to a special calling. He's called you to overcome. What we need to get out of this message today is that if we are lukewarm or cold, we need to be zealous. In other words, have a burning desire is what that word means. Turn to Jesus. Repent. Turn to Jesus. Get that relationship right. Come unto me, he says, all ye that are heavy laden and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word today. Lord, there's some watching me there. Possibly even the description of the Laodicean church describes them. And they know it. They've played the game. They've, they've said the prayer, but they know they're not what they should be or where they should be in their walk with you. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to each and every one of us. Help us, Lord, to see the truth, to examine our lives to recognize if we're walking the talk. Oh, Holy Spirit, do that work that only you can do. Speak to our hearts and then reveal to us that we are sons of God. Sons of God above those things he describes of the Laodicean church. Come, Holy Spirit, speak to us, I pray. Oh, Lord, turn our hearts toward you. We give you the praise. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.